Hi guys and welcome to another episode of the Boxing Coalition. My name is Cam. Joining me tonight, Naota, Welsh Joe and Hamada. Hope you guys are well. Quickly before we start, I've got some good news and some bad news, but I think I'll leave the bad till the end of the show and start off with the good. Our coalition brother, King Jay, from Chicago, has become a father for the second time. His wife gave birth to a beautiful baby girl, I think either today or yesterday. So um, congratulations, Jay, your wife and your son, Liam, who's become a, a big brother now. And, and congrats to the rest of the family as well. Blessings. Okay. Get onto the boxing. Bad news later on. Don't want to start off with that. Naota, Joe, Hamada, hope you guys are good. Naota, I'll start with you. Let's talk Canelo putting 51,000, but I've heard rumors it may have been more. Bums in seats in Texas against Liam Smith. Give us your thoughts on the fight. Uh, well, I mean, my thoughts on the fight was, I mean, it was turning out to be a little bit more competitive and really a more fun to watch fight than I really expected. Um, I thought that Alvarez was going to be able to just handle Smith with ease, um, take whatever he had and just be able to blow him out. But I mean, Smith looked like he was, um, giving him a, a little bit of resistance there the first couple of rounds and probably like rounds three through five, I thought were pretty competitive. I wound up giving Smith, um, two of the rounds before he eventually got, started getting dropped and then eventually got stopped. But, I mean, like, Smith pretty much impressed me. I mean, Alvarez, I already kind of knew what he was bringing to the table, and he brought a lot of the same things. Um, he was able to land those overhand rights uh, up high on the temple and eventually get him out of there with um, the body shots. But, I mean, Smith was landing some hell- some hellacious shots of his own um, that they opened up that cut on Canelo's eye, on the outside of his eye. And, I mean, did a, a overall pretty good job and, I mean, made for a much better fight than I really expected. So um, I, I liked the fight. I didn't like it going into it, but I came out of it um, being more impressed and just enjoying it more than I otherwise thought that I would have. Um, as far as Alvarez filling the stadium, you know, that just shows goes to show the, the, the star power of the man. And, um, you know, it's one of those things where he'll uh, – he'll definitely prove to be an attraction win or lose for, for years to come just by virtue of a uh, name value. But um, I'm not sure exactly if he's going to be staying at 154, or moving back to 160. I mean, from all the sounds of it, it sounds like he's probably going to stay at light middleweight. And, you know, there's plenty of opportunities for him there as well. Um, I, I could very well see somebody like Kel Brook coming up next because of the fact that, you know, comparison fight with Golovkin, considering the, the back and forth the war words between him and Golovkin. Um, but, uh, it looks like he's not going to be coming back on December cause I guess he jacked up his, uh, I think it was his thumb or one of, one of his fingers. He, I guess, uh, had a, had some sort of a fracture. So he's not going to be back as soon as originally planned. I imagine they'll probably wait all the way until May again to have him fight again, uh, because of that, which is unfortunate, but you know, it's just the way things go sometimes. But I mean, um, Honestly, I, overall, I think I was more impressed with uh, Smith than with Alvarez in terms of what they actually brought to the table, though. Ah, I don't know, Nate. I don't know. Like, to me, Canelo was very impressive. My thoughts on Smith is similar to what my thoughts on Brook were last week. I give him props. He didn't just go there to fall over. He was putting in an effort, but they were levels apart in skill, in power, in most, uh, probably all, all attributes. And... Smith was tense initially, man. Like he showed his shoulders, his shoulders were really high. He, he loosened up, and yeah, I agree with you. I give, two, I give him two rounds. Um, I, but power-wise, he, he didn't have any pop on his punches, and like Canelo, some of those body shots were like gunshots. You know, the sound they were having on on TV, and from some articles I read at ringside, they were loud as hell. And yeah, it's just. Even before the fight, it was it was a fight where they were levels apart, and it was the same in the ring. Smith put up an effort, but those body shots just chopped him in half, especially that last one. But he was brave, yeah. and I hope he comes back. There's a lot of decent fights for him back in the UK, and that's about my thoughts. Joe, your thoughts on the whole situation in the fight? Um, yeah, sort of similar to you, Cam, in a way that I'd sort of in the build-up to the fight. I think a lot of people, and probably me included, had almost sort of forgotten how good Canelo was because of the talk around Triple G, and he looked really drained when he came in at 154. I like I sort of forgot, in a way, that you know this guy, as much as people have given him shit for ducking Golovkin, 
that he actually is an elite 154 pounder, and, well, probably even a 160. I mean, even though he barely has fought any 160 guys, you'd sort of back him to beat a lot of 160 title lists. Good point. Yeah. So, I just think, yeah, it's just levels apart, isn't it? I mean, it just shows you how easily you can grab belts these days when you put a guy that's supposed to be like one of the top four guys in boxing, the guy comes back down to 154 and just completely destroys him. And, you know, I give him props as well. I mean, he was brave, went there to win, but... It just shows that the the Joe Gallagher game plan only works when you fight guys that are of a certain level. When you take that Joe Gallagher game plan into the elite level, you come up against like you know a Carl Frampton or even someone like an Arthur Abraham with Paul Smith. Just anyone of any sort of quality, they can box their way around it, or they've just got too much power to go through it. Because the Gallagher game plan of having a high guard marching him down, trying to wear your opponent down so you can finish him off later. You know, it only works against, you know, your, the guy that Crawler fought last time. Yeah. It's just, he's, he's the ring trainer of the year, but you just think that you see the same game plan every single fight, and all his fighters fight in the exact same way. So there's no sort of versatility there that you might see with other top trainers. But, I don't know, Liam Smith, he'll come again. Canelo, you know, you could go on a whole podcast about how much of a how much of an absolute I don't know joke he is and his promoter is for continuing to put the 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 Golovkin fight off either until Golovkin loses or he they see enough in him that they reckon they can beat him but you know that's the fight that needs to be made but overall like pretty impressive from Canelo but what that's kind of what you expected yeah levels yeah, yeah what, do you, what do you mean Joe he, he Golovkin turned down three offers eight figures <laughs> Pamela, you don't tell me you believe that bullshit. I mean, that's what's been said, you know, mate. You yeah, turned it down, them down, didn't it? Yeah, but come on, mate. I mean, they came up with all this stuff. Just sarcastic. I know, I know, I know. But do you know what I mean? They came up the last time Canelo, I mean, he, last time he fought, they came up with all this, you know, Mexicans, we got balls, you know, we'll fight anyone, you know. But then. They come up a few weeks later, dropping the belt, saying, oh, we're going to fight him, not the next time, or not even the time after the next time. We're going to try and fight him at the back end of next year, which is just completely ridiculous. I mean, I've given, I give Canelo props for fighting the guys that he probably, you didn't expect him to do early on in his career in terms of like, you know, the Lara fight, the Trout fight. You know, he stepped up and fought Mayweather. All right, that was a big money fight, but, you know, he stepped up for it. It's just... He's just as soon as a guy that comes along that is actually a real threat to his chin, not just his but not just his boxing ability. You know, he doesn't want any part of it. Hamada, your thoughts on the fight? I totally disagree with now now on what he what he said earlier. I didn't see a competitive fight at any stage. It was just the the difference in. Just everything, skill, movement, power. intelligence, power, <clears throat> reflexes, everything was just so wide. It was ridiculous. I mean, Smith, zero head movement, square. All Canelo was doing was taking a little step to his left. And Smith is just so square. It's like, my coach always tells me, like, your belly button should not be facing your opponent when you when you're when you're sparring whatever. And like Smith is so square with his with his upper body, and all Canelo was doing was just taking a little step to his left. And he's the target's wide open for him. He he can do what he wants: body shots, uppercuts, hooks around the guard. He was doing what he wanted. The only time Smith had any success was when Canelo decided to take time off and sit on the ropes and try his little Floyd Mayweather shoulder roll slickness on the ropes where Smith would occasionally touch him up, but nothing flush. Just Smith looked really slow. I saw so several slow. flesh punches landed from Smith. I don't know. I saw a lot of shots Canelo was rolling with, but Smith seemed so slow like and ponderous. I don't know. He, they came with the excuse afterwards saying they didn't spar for a month before <laughs> from a month before the fight. But 
I, I grill everyone then, as well. I grill everyone when they say like, no excuse, but I didn't do this, and I, I, I cut my eye and I didn't spar, but no excuses though. But I can't give them a pass, man. I hate when people say that. No excuses, but yeah. you know what I don't yeah, get? It's uh, just crap. If 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 that's the case, then why don't you pull out the fight? <sighs> Just well, the, the thing is, the thing is, even if it was the case, there's no way that they would want to pull out the fight because then they're not going to, no, they're never going to get it. Again. Yeah, Smith will never see that sort of money again in his career, most likely. Personally, I think. But that, but that's a devil's advocate argument. It's, I think it's bullshit too. You know, they're just making excuses. I just think like if that's if that's true, like you got to pull out the fight. You got to give yourself the best possible chance of winning it, right or wrong. Like I mean, the title's on the line. I'm surely like that should mean something. Well, then kiss the kiss those millions of dollars goodbye. Then I don't even yeah, think you got millions good of luck dollars. For, good luck following fighting for a quarter of that in whoever you fight instead. I, I don't know. I, then yep. then what? Then it, then it was just a money grab. Then basically, uh, it's a risk versus reward. I liked I his know. confidence ahead of the fight like he's going in there saying i'm going to win and stuff but i think deep down he probably knew look you know it's it's it is a bit of a money situation he's got a belt he's coming over to the states you know he even came out first you know the champ normally comes out second so this whole show was for canelo the whole stadium like you know independence day weekend everything it, it, it was a spotlight on canelo he was just he was just the, the dude that's getting getting beat up I think yeah, them knockdowns though were, were nice, especially when the body hit. shot. The body shot that ended it is probably the best body shot I've seen for a long, long time. I, I disagree, man. I like the, the the body shot before that, where Smith had the delayed reaction. Yeah, mm. you know, nah, that, 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 was one, that was just so clean. It was just the, like, the, yeah, was, the last was, one was clean, but I do in, a, a delayed reaction. This is something quite satisfying yeah. about that, and it was uh, ironic well, that. The, Sorry, Neoto. It was a run. That the last one that ended it. It was a. It was a move that Liam Smith does himself, like the little tap upstairs and then the hook round the elbow. And it just, you know, what goes around comes around, and it happened to him. But it was a beautiful shot. Yeah, I mean that that last one was just so damn clean. Like even if it, even if, uh, in, if it would have been on the other side, even without all the major organs right there, that still would have buckled him just by virtue of how hard it was. You know what I like? The it was nasty. First one. I like the first one because Smith didn't see it, so he got hit with it, and he stepped back, and then all of a sudden he felt it. Like that's what I like about it because he just he was throwing at the same time where Canelo just slipped that in, yeah, right yeah. underneath, and that's what caused the delay reaction because um, he didn't see it. So obviously, when you took the step back, that's when he felt it because he didn't even know that punch even hit him. And you spar as well. You know those shots to the solar plexus are awful. Yeah. They just tighten yeah, up your chest, me. man. You can't do nothing about it. You know, it's just... much worse. It's much worse when you when you get hit to the body while you're throwing at the same time as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least when you get hit, when you when you can see it coming, you can Tense brace it. yourself for it. Yeah. What were you gonna say, Joe? No, I was just saying like. This is the third Smith. I don't want to hate on the Smith brothers yet, because that's like the hot, latest thing to do if you're hardcore. But it's the third time you've had a Smith brother fighting domestic level guys, jumping up to fight world level and getting pasted. I mean, have these guys not learned that you know maybe it'd be an idea just to build your way up through the gears? I mean, the same might happen to Callum now. He might get chucked in with like a De Gale or a Badu Jack without ever having beaten anyone in the top 15 world rankings. so This is what I said last week, though. I said Liam Smith is so unproven. He hasn't fought anybody with any sort of credibility. Well, mate, and the- he's going to be way out of his depth. This is what happened. It happened to Paul and Stephen. All it's- right, you know, I give Paul credit because he did have a good fight with Abraham the first fight, and I even had Paul Smith winning the first fight. But, I mean, you can't, you can't just... The levels, I mean... It's ridiculous. It's like the best Smith is still Rocky Fielding out of all of them. The best guy that a Smith has beaten is Rocky Fielding. I I agree, man. It's just you you can't do that. I mean, I mean, I understand they they're scared. You know, they they don't they think they might lose to you know if they fight someone decent at European level or something like or fringe contender. But I mean. 
the writing was only on the wall. I mean, <clears throat> that, the gap in levels, I mean, from who's the last guy he fought? I don't even know who he fought last, but from the likes of Eric Ocheng and that Thompson guy to then go fight Canelo. It just seems like the whole Gallagher game plan of manoeuvring his fighters is, I don't know, get a world title somehow or get a high ranking, fight nobody, and then just go into the big fight. Like, like, protect him until he gets the big fight. We've we seen it with Quig. We've seen on. it with... Do you know what I mean? We've seen it with Quig. We've seen it with Steven Smith. We're seeing it now with Paul Smith, where he's fighting, I mean, six-rounders, waiting for a, a call for the world title. <laughs> show. I mean, it's just... It's, I, 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 if I was Callum Smith, I'd be sitting there thinking, like, hold on a minute. I mean, look what's going on around me. Like, he should demand now to whoever... Listen, I want to fight, say, bro, Abraham. Bro, bro. I want to fight someone, yeah. someone like, a, you don't have to fight a killer, but fight a decent level guy before you step in with the best in the weight. Do you know what I'm trying to do? Yeah, just because um, we're going off on a tangent here, but like, just to go back to Canelo, like, people have been saying, oh, I think you know, you probably looked better than. GG uh, G, uh, Triple G did in comparison to his fight. I don't really agree. I just think both guys showed nothing new. They showed that you know what they're good at. What what Canelo, you know, he still struggles. Might struggle with a guy who can give him movement, but it's just it's frustrating. I mean, we wanted the fight at the end of 2016, and we've been calling for this fight for what, nearly a year now. Yeah. We're gonna have to I wait another year. I don't. I honestly don't even see that gap, this whole, like, oh, Alvarez looked more impressive against Smith than Golovkin did against Brooke. I don't think so. For one, I think Brooke is a better fighter, a better boxer than Smith. I'd take Brooke to beat Smith's ass. Yeah. And the thing is... And, Lee, I mean, I thought Lee, Smith was just as competitive with Alvarez as Brooke was with fucking Golovkin. And if you could design a fighter to look for Canelo to look good against, it would be Liam Smith, some guy that just sits in front of you with a nice high guard and you can just tee off on your combinations because that's, to be fair to Canelo, that's one of his... Massive strong points is his shot selection and his combination punching. Yeah. If, he, if you've got a guy that stands, if he's got a guy that stands in front of him and doesn't move, he will break. He will break you down very easily. Yeah, he's a, well. Lots of people talk about like one-dimensional type fighters. He's very one-dimensional in terms of he can go backwards just fine, but he can't come forwards worth a shit. Yeah, so um, let's just hope. Because I, I, I give props to Kellerman after, I mean, calling out De La Hoya, that was pretty funny, just looking at him in the background squirming away while his fighter gets a grill in, which is what you need from broadcasters in the ring, not, you know, tossing them up little softballs so they can hit him back with really media-trained answers. You need to start grilling them and why these fights aren't happening. But, you know, all Canelo has to say is, Viva Mexico, and then everyone, like, cheers and stuff, and we don't actually get any answers. Yeah, well, you know, taking advantage of casual dumbasses, basically. That'll 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 watch him fight the mailman. I looked at Tom Loeffler's um, Twitter account today, and there was no post about anything that Canelo said, whether about you know the figures that they were offered, and they didn't hear anything back. I personally think it's bullshit, but who knows? But I don't understand why Loeffler isn't absolutely hammering Canelo for a dropping that belt, and then saying, you're the one pulling out of this fight. Just chase the fight. Make it hard for them to say no to it. They're just sort of going along with it as if they're quite happy to let them like manoeuvre themselves around a, a Triple G fight. I guess they just know that they are kind of the B-side, so maybe by stalking them and doing that, they might just lose the fight altogether. So I think they're just playing playing it safe and just well, thinking... Is, know they're the B-side, then accept 25%, 30% of whatever Canelo will give you. I think they should. I think by, you know, take the take, take the smaller money now, beat him, and then you're on that platform then. But I guess, just to play devil's advocate to myself, what they will do is Canelo will sort of have all these stipulations, like weight stipulations, it's going to be a one one five six, no rehydration limit, all this, you know, everything will be stacked in his favour. But... I don't get it. I think fighting Golovkin at 160 would only be beneficial to Alvarez himself because he's clearly killing himself to get down to whatever weight he fights at 54, 55. It will probably, you know, give him a bit more, a bit more energy, a bit more gas in the tank. So, because 
Canelo clearly, this is what Canelo does his whole career, where where he just sits on the ropes and tries to take time off in rounds. Against Golovkin, you can't afford to sit on the ropes. That's what well, Golovkin that's does his best work. That's why he's stopped uh, releasing the, his like pre night his pre uh, pre fight weight figures. Like, have you noticed now? You never actually know what Canelo weighs in his in his latest few fights because he he doesn't want people knowing that he weighs about 180 180 pounds going into that ring. So the fact that you know I'm not a natural middleweight, it just removes that excuse for why he can't fight Golovkin if he comes in heavier than Golovkin does. You, you know yeah. he'll never fight for an IBF title, man, because he's not going to make that 10 percent. <laughs> no way. Absolutely no. no chance. Not even close. No, but I don't know. I after watching yesterday's fight, I don't know. I I always thought Canelo Golovkin was a was a mismatch. You know, uh, ninety like at least ninety five. I'd give Canelo five percent, but that's gone up for me. Like that's probably gone up to about eighty twenty for me. I think seeing how Brooks had, go on sorry. Wait, seeing how Brooks hand speed troubled him a bit early and you know the little subtle moves but I can see Canelo giving him issues just for about two or three rounds but eventually he'll get stopped when he's, well, when he's honestly, sitting on the ropes I, I think a lot of that hand speed causing him problems though I think that was Golovkin being like very like kind of what? dismissive of Brooks overall ability to, to begin with because I think with guys that he knows that he could just beat any way he feels like it he gets real lax with um, his defense and his overall technique. But against somebody like Alvarez, I don't think he'd be, you know, lackadaisical at all. I think he would go in there and, you know, you, to the top of his game and destroy you, him. You get a much more disciplined Golovkin in that fight than the, like, the wild well, sort of what, Like when he fought Curtis Stevens, the whole thing is, you know, he was able to keep Stevens from really landing anything flush or, because or he, was like, he was on his P's and Q's. I've, yeah, I've, same thing. I've, I think the Lemieux fight is probably his most complete performance, even though mm-hmm. you know he probably took a bit of time to get the stoppage in comparison to other fights. Yeah, yeah. But compare that, that is... to compare that to Monroe, where he let Monroe pretty much do whatever the hell he wanted. You know, he let him get inside and rattle off combinations but... and the whole nine because he wanted to get the... leverage on his own shots to knock him the, the fuck out. The Lemieux fight was just such a demonstration in how to not a nullify a guy's punching ability and b to just absolutely dominate them. So if you if you bring that. Golovkin into a Canelo fight, I I can't see it being that competitive at all. No, but I'm just saying, like I I previously thought it was a mismatch, like they shouldn't be in the ring with each other. That's what I previously. But I think eighty twenty is well fair. I mean, you wouldn't give Canelo a twenty percent chance of being Golovkin. I give him about yeah about fifteen percent, twenty percent. Yeah, I mean, still heavy. I still heavily think Golovkin will beat him, but I'm just saying, like you know, I. I don't know. Maybe I dismissed Canelo, and I and I didn't. I didn't really. I forgot. I, don't, I mean, he did disappoint in the Cotto fight. He did disappoint us. You know, he didn't. I don't know. He didn't. He, he looked all right, but he didn't show us the what he had. You know, like obviously Smith was. He he was tearing off on Smith and that, but I don't know, man. I just maybe I forgot how good Canelo was. Regarding the hand injury, the thumb injury, I don't know. After the fight, I thought he's like making an excuse where he didn't need to make an excuse because I thought he he fought excellent. His combinations were great. His power was good. So when he mentioned it, I was kind of iffy because I thought, well, he kept well, I don't fought. think it's an excuse. They're saying that that they diagnosed it, and he, he's not even going to fight at all. The rest no, no, of the I, year, I know so. that. What, my, my point is that he was saying, you no, know, he, he wasn't like throwing the right hand with conviction as much but I thought he was like I didn't see any point where he kind of like uses left more because he uses his left quite often anyway you know like with the lead uppercuts and the hook behind it and stuff so mm-hmm. I at first I did think it was an excuse but now they come out and think well he's not going to fight in December and ah, it's unlikely that's an excuse now because that's money and that's revenue they're going to lose because obviously that's exactly. gate, yeah that's gate receipts to lose and that's pay-per-view they're losing so I just thought it was funny he mentioned it. I thought he may m- would have stayed stum about his injury, but it was a, it was a weird one. But quickly, like instead of seeing Canelo's mother at ringside, man, I'd rather see like Daniel Lim, <laughs> <laughs> like, like Lim just reacting to like Canelo just being a beast, and it's like I think that'd yeah. be better. I, honestly, like I hate to sound like a hater, but it's probably gonna come off this way. I'm tired of seeing his mom. I'm tired of seeing his family. I don't give a shit. I <laughs> really it. don't. I'm sorry. Matter of fact. 
the fact that like it makes me want to see him get knocked out even more now because like I'm tired of seeing all of them and I want to see him. I want to see them just completely crushed and destroyed emotionally. Like right, crying. Oh, that's harsh. But I think he's yeah. just. It's funny how he's just completely given up learning English as well. Like you, he was sort of around the Mayweather. He was like, you could tell he was like trying to because they needed him to cross over into the states. But he's just sort of fuck it. I he's can't. Like, be fuck now. I'm making yeah. enough enough money in Mexico. I don't need the. I really. I really hope Golovkin gets that fight with him and breaks his face, and then uh, then I'll so I'll love to see those reactions. That'll be incredible. That'll make my that'll make my fucking year, man. <laughs> that's my day. Right. Anything you else know, we got in this fight? Go on, Amanda. I, I was just gonna say. I mean, I don't know, man. I think we're too harsh on the fighters, man. I mean, in boxing, it's not like other sports. If you do pick up an injury while you're fighting, you can't just come off and and you know someone else come on for you or something like that. They have to continue the fight, otherwise, you know, they've lost, so... Well, as, much, as much money and fame as Alvarez gets, I feel very little pity for him, it's, you know, especially compared to most other fighters. I just think we, we get, we're a bit too harsh on these fighters, man. I mean, no matter what, if they pick up an injury in the fight, they have to continue. They, they've got no choice, unlike in other sports, you know, you can just say, you know, I'm hurt, I'm coming off. No, one guy, is you know too, I mean? one guy is too harsh on him. I'm not going to name names, but I think we all know who that is. Anything else regarding this fight? I'm um, just happy to see a Joe Gallagher fighter get stopped to the body. <laughs> How can you say with two harsh and fighters and you just come and slate Gallagher? It's just great, you know. I mean, he teaches... Well, Gallagher's a what, trainer, so... <laughs> he, that's all he teaches. Wakes up in the morning, he thinks about... Body shots, body, sleeps body at shot. night, <laughs> dreams about body shots, and his fighter gets stopped with body shots. I mean, great, man. <laughs> but to be honest, I don't even have a problem with Liam Smith. I think that he's of oh, the older Smith brothers, the most likable, but I just can't stand Joe. And you know, something I noticed too is the WBO used to do it, but it doesn't seem like they do it anymore. So now we probably won't even really get like the 30 day and 7 day wins from Alvarez either. Because I know the WBC does that, but. Uh, the WBO used to, uh, but I haven't seen him do it in at least a year. So, depending I mean, um, depending on now that that gives us even less information about how much this dude weighs and how big he is and all that stuff. Depending on when he fights next, I think he'll probably drop the belt and just go back to Canelo weight or just to catch weight one fifty six or something. Prepare for one sixty. Well, and the thing is, he has the ring belt, so I mean that's all that really matters in the first place. You know, it's the, it's Oscar's uh, magazine's belt, and you know. They could talk about how he's the ring of the lineal championship. So, I mean, all when it comes to the ABCs, yeah, for him it definitely doesn't matter because the ring belt, generally speaking, is the most prized of the of the bunch. And then also just the fact that I mean, it kind of signifies him being the lineal middleweight champion and all that stuff. You know, regardless of whatever any, anybody wants to put out there about him supposedly not being the champion, you beat the man, you you are the man, and that's what he where he's at, like it or not. No, I was listening to the uh, the boxing slam yesterday, and uh, Andy was saying that if you don't fight at the weight for a year against a top ten opponent, then you vacate the lineal. It automatically vacates it. Is that true? Uh yeah, yeah. From from what I understand, that's so. That's correct, we fought so. Costa in November, and he's had two hundred and fifty four pound fights. Is he? Well, what was the Khan fight? No, no, the no the Khan was one fifty five. Five, yeah. Yeah, but is, Khan's not a top 10 ranked guy, is he? Oh, he was top 10 at welterweight, so they'll probably they'll probably accept that. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, you just make it on rules, that's all it is. Just do what yeah, you they, want. They, they'll probably just keep it with him, won't they? Yeah. yeah. He's, he's I just that think, joke, man. Another thing yeah. that I saw was, um, I read somewhere that the HBO won't, aren't releasing pay-per-view buys now. Like, They're doing a sky. So you won't even know how... Yeah, yeah, so you won't even know how well, how, like, big Canelo is doing. Gonna, so now they can cook the books however they want it. They cook them anyway, who cares? Yeah, I'm just going to say, uh, very, I'm going to put my um, game on Toya hat on. Um, I'm very suspicious about Canelo, because, like, I saw pictures of him at the way in. Taking the pills? He, not a pill. I didn't see him take a pill, but he looked he looked skinny at the way in, like he looked slim, he looks skinny and then on fight night he just looks like a bodybuilder. Like how do you do that in thirty hours? Plus obviously 
There was well, no uh, testing you, for this fight. You, you, well, you, eat a, you, eat a, you eat about 15,000 calories and drink a lot and you know, salt yeah, and I've heard somewhere salt that sugar, man. I've heard somewhere he gets put on a drip, and I don't know if that's legal or if it that's is. okay. Or, well, yeah. I can't imagine that's flipping beneficial to your body, though. There was no testing. Actually, actually it's more beneficial than just taking it in um, gastrointestinally, you know, just consuming it through your mouth. It's because it, it allows you to rehydrate that much quicker and recover that much faster. Plus, like, obviously, the, you know, there was no testing. You know, they decided not to do Vada and... Um, the well, there was, was the commission. There was the commission testing, and to be honest with yeah, you, yeah, but I'm that's gonna, a joke, man. Commission that, testing. you saw all that shit is overrated. If you don't, if you if you think that people can't beat those tests, you're fooling your fucking self. No, but I'm just saying, commission testing is not testing, basically. It's an IQ test. Isn't it? Well, I mean, out, honestly, all the Vada and Usada is about the same thing. It's very easy to pass those tests. Very Possibly. easy. But you, you're, they're more likely to catch you than the commission. Well, shit, they didn't catch Shane Mosley back in the day. Well, they're catching people. They caught people, so I mean, you got. You know, they, didn't catch La- they, they didn't catch Lance Armstrong either, and he was on all the shit. Yeah, but time got to Lance Armstrong. Everyone gets caught in the end. Yeah, exactly. You hope so, anyway. All right. Um, should we move on? Yep, 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 yep. Talk about how sexy Gabe. Rosado looked in his 80s aerobic outfit. Like, what the fuck was he wearing, man? Pretty boy gang. <laughs> Damn. You know well, he was, probably, he was probably wearing the um, the compression tights because they were, you know, in a kind of an outdoor arena. So it was probably pretty chilly out there. Probably just trying to stay warm. Didn't really help him, though. Um, if anything, he probably constricted his movement and made it so that Monroe was able to outbox him more easily. Although the ref missed that knockdown, man. He, he, he should have got credited for that knockdown in the 10th round. Yeah, he should have. Put, for, for me, it was a really but, poor fight. Like, yeah, just he didn't start early enough. He didn't. He wasn't throwing enough punches. wasn't feigning enough. He just wasn't active enough overall with his upper body. You know, and it, he allowed Monroe to dictate the pace with his feet, essentially. Yeah, I just it, he, he, his distance was poor initially, and then Monroe was just coming over his job. With with the right hook and spinning off, similar to what Haskins was doing to Stuart Hall a couple of weeks ago, or last week I think. But um, yeah, except yeah, for longer. But only when Rosado started doing a bit of pressure, that's when he he was starting to have a bit of success when he was kind of sitting on his chest. And mm-hmm. um, I don't know about Fernando Vargas. Like there were times in the commentary I was hearing in Box Nation where he was like saying, "Oh, you're winning it, and you just need to do a bit more." And like, yeah, same, the, round, yeah. the rounds he was saying he was winning, I thought he lost it. So I don't know yeah. if it was a mental thing or he was just giving him wrong instructions. Like, did you hear some of that, Naoto? No, no, yeah, they 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 played it during the corner, and even yeah, Lampley and Cole were all saying like, "I don't know what the hell he's talking about." Like, <laughs> like he's, I, I don't think that's a good thing to be telling Rosado because they really need to have more of a sense of urgency in order to cut off the ring and everything. Yeah, I don't know. It was weird. Weird. I mean, but I mean, eventually it seemed like Vargas started giving him the correct advice in order to, you know, kind of vary up his punches and combination and stuff. But yeah, the early, the early on stuff was just odd. That's all you could really say about it. Yeah, BSH316 in the chat saying Gabe is done. And yeah, I'm done with him. I don't want to see him on my team. This was pay per view undercard. Like, Gabe Rosado on a pay per view undercard. That was is... the worst fight. It was the worst fight of the card. It was, man. It was. Terrible, and it it kind of sucked the energy out of the stadiums, like some of the fights did last week. You know, it's like they kind of built the fights in the wrong order. Like I thought, Jojo Diaz was much like that, more. That should have been a starter. That should have been the starter between Rosado and Monroe. No, I agree. I agree. And Mar, did you see this fight? No, I didn't see it. But you know, I I don't mind Gabe Rosado, man. I hope he comes back and fights more fights than BKB. <laughs> that, that's why he's the champ. Undefeated. Nah, man. Gabe needs to go now. Like, go back to. How many? Bristol. How many fights has he won in BKB? He's like four and zero, something. I don't know. Is it something two? like that? Is that Three and zero, four and zero, something like that. He's got a good record in BKB. He should just stick to that. But the truth is, they made this. Um, probably made this the co-main because they, the winner's probably going to get Alvarez, isn't it? Well, the same. That was that, the idea. But... I don't know how that would work. Firstly, obviously, you got 154 and 160. Like, 
I knew Monroe was going to win, but I think he'd struggle to get down to 154 because he's a he's a thick set guy, man. Like he's got a lot well, of muscle. That's, muscle. That, that just makes things better for Alvarez. True, but then <laughs> I read today that his uh, trainer says that he, they're ruling uh, Monroe out because I think that's a a bad style matchup. You know, someone that he'd, ha- that he'd have to chase it almost be um, Lara all over again. You know, running from one side of the ring to the other side. So I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. I think yeah, most likely. I think they they probably got a false impression from the Golovkin fight that he might go at you and really try to fight you on the inside. But I think that was a very particular style that he tried to use for Golovkin, basically trying to do, do like Kasim Uma and do that type now, of thing. Now, but Monroe tried, tried to move. In, he tried to move in the first couple of rounds of the Golovkin fight, and then he just got he got put on his ass. They thought, you know, yeah, what, hell with this. I might as well go to war with him and try yeah. him on the inside, and so. Yeah, yeah. One tactic work. fails, you try a different one. Yeah, that's true. All right, let's get to this dude that's on the phone line. All black ski mask, love, tuck the thing. Ski mask, wait. I still got the black ski mask to throw on. Yo, Cam, who is this bum? Dunk on this nigga. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> Yo, what up, man? Y'all motherfuckers talking about Gabe Rosado and all this bullshit? Shit. <laughs> What's going on, guys? Man, honestly, man, you know what, Gabe Rosado? You a bum, dog. If you listen to this shit with your lady, man, with your brand new kid, you a bum, dog. I know you're laying down on your sofa, probably like, man, who the fuck is this fat motherfucker, man? I'm gonna fire him on Philly. But you know what, man? You a bum, dog. That's all I gotta say. Man, sure. but you know, you know, you know they're gonna <laughs> give right, him. <clears throat> you know they, you know they're gonna give him Canelo though. I was gonna say that yeah. just then, Joe. I was gonna say, well, they won't, they won't go for Monroe. They'll choose a loser and pick Rosado for Canelo's next opponent. You know, you know it is, man, because um, he was posting online all this depressing shit. Like he, he, this is done. He's done for. He's like done with boxing and yada yada yada. I think because he's been loyal with Golden Boy, I think they probably might give him, like, one last big paycheck, you know. Maybe something he didn't earn, but, you know, at least he has a good following, you know. So they'll probably give him Canelo, and then we'll give, give it shit when, when it does happen. But then again, it's it's going to be for a highlight reel. They know that Gabe Rosado cuts easy, you know. So Canelo's going to go in there, bust him up, make him bleed, you know, knock him out. And it's gonna look good, man. And that's what we nah, want. We want to see blood. I, we want to see highlights. I don't. I don't think so. I, I don't see that happening. Uh, honestly, the way, when it comes to Alvarez, like regardless of how much we're gonna want to call him and and company a, a cherry picker and all that stuff, is they they still pick their opponents in a way where they, you can't criticize them too too much. Like they you could, they have to at least have a, a win coming in or having looked you know fairly impressive in their own right coming into the fight. Well, what do you they think they're going to give him? What do you think they're going to give him? It's either him or David Lemieux. David Lemieux is trying to rebuild his career from the ground up. This guy's no, already I on mean, his way out. I, I, I'd imagine Lemieux would be uh, more likely than him, to be honest with nah. you. I think, I think Rosado would, would be the one at 160. Beat him up real quick. If the fucking shit with Gennady the Golovkin doesn't happen in September, fuck it. There you go. Throw him David Lemieux. I could see, it again, then, maybe Curtis Stevens as well. No, they, no, uh, they, I, I think they'd have to get Rosado a win before they do anything like that. I think if they give Curtis Stevens, they got to really pay Curtis Stevens a lot of money. Not not because he like deserves it or shit, but it's just that Curtis Stevens been in um he's been in a lot of Canelo's training camps. You know, he's been like he helped them out for a lot of fights. So I think they will have to give him like real good money. Yeah, but if you I don't think they're putting Alvarez against anybody that could punch. So Stevens is ruled out completely. So Rosado, it is. I mean, go, uh, Oscar Deloy, if you listen to this, to this show, man, you know, we got you, baby. We're already making the decisions for you, baby boy. <laughs> man, don't put that shit in his head. I don't want to see Rosado's bum ass against Canelo. You know, yeah, man. Why, Why not? not? <laughs> Why not? Fuck Rosado. <laughs> Why not? Let's phone Canadian Jose and get his opinion. <laughs> now, but, Joe, what did you think of the fight itself, Smith versus Canelo? Um, I did, thought it was good. Did you, um, did, you did you Did you buy it? Did you buy the pay-per-view? I pitched in with my with my family, you know. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. Lo- local Mexican says they're gonna give Kamagai to Rosado. I'd rather see Kamagai against Alvarez. <laughs> <laughs> hey, speaking of Kamagai, tell me why one of my boys he went um 
grocery shop and it bumped into Soto Karras. He took pictures with him and shit. And I was like, damn, this motherfucker looks fat. It was, was, like, was, he, was he was he drunk and had his shirt off or what? Nah, he just had his like a white tee and a savage's shirt and a savage's hat. <laughs> Yo, man, bitch. This motherfucker told him, hey, what happened with Kama guy, man? He was like, hey, that Chinese motherfucker could punch. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, man, man. The, the Smith Canelo, it was a good fight for Canelo to show his uh, technical abilities, you know, the body punches, all that bullshit. But, uh, Smith, I give him credit for, for actually landing something. At first, I thought he was just going to be a fucking body, uh, body uh, what is it, the... Punching bag. Fuck it. Yeah, punching bag. Well, they should have put him in a body bag at the end, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right, yeah. man. Yeah, man, but a fucking... He was a punching bag, like, the first three rounds until, like, the fourth round. I, I, I think they probably must have told him, hey, man, you know you're down on the fucking cards or something because he started coming alive, but as soon as he started winging those shots, there was he was getting more open. But... Canelo, like, versus Triple G, it's a whole nother thing, man. I've seen Triple G live, like, three times. And it's, I don't know if the the TV just does it any justice, man, but Triple G knows how to fucking cut off the ring, man. And that motherfucker's a beast. The way he just manhandled Monroe. I mean, a guy that was, like, outboxing his um, fucking Gabe Rosado's ears, you know? And i seen him in the, what was it, that ESPN show? What, 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 what was um, What was he on? Like he was on some like kind of tournament. Uh, the Boxino. Oh, Boxino. Yeah, there you go. He was boxing almost all those fuckers off, like, and Triple G just like cut some like like bread on butter, man, like a butter knife. Boom. You know what I mean? So Triple G versus Canelo, it'll be it'll be a tough one for Canelo to showcase all those skills. Well, probably, possibly it might be even even. Fuck it. I like how you just contradict yourself, Joe. But <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's uh, just quickly talk about Jojo Diaz. Neil, to have like mentioned him quite a few times. I like watching him. I love his uh, how he mixes up body and head, head body combinations. He mixes them up. Um, fun to watch his opponent. I don't know. It was a bit too, bit too basic. He, he actually, I think, he hurt his hand as well. But, but like Canelo, he yeah. kept throwing it with conviction. Well, so. Honestly, I thought Conceal was going to give him a tougher fight than he did because I had seen him when he fought uh, Ronnie Rios, you know, another Golden Boy prospect, and he also knocked out Rene Alvarado, who was a pretty good fighter at that weight class. So um, I actually thought that Conceal would give him a tougher fight. I didn't think that JoJo would be able to just dominate him and stop him the way that he did. So that really impressed me. Um, he's looked better in his last couple of fights than he had before because before I didn't really rate Diaz like that all that highly. I thought he, you know, he was pretty good. They had a little too many liabilities defensively i think he's cleaned a lot of that up he's a lot better at um kind of anticipating punches being able to either block him with his gloves and then and then counter or being able to just completely evade him completely in you know entirely and uh you know his inside game is really really solid um he's able to kind of just you know bend and twist at the right waist and everything and avoid punches and come right back at you with with clean shots and i mean they had him like basically tripling the percentage of conceal so, I mean, that was pretty impressive, too. You, do, you don't usually see a guy landing, like, almost 60% of his shots compared to 20 of his opponents. You know, that's, like, some comfy box record type shit. So, um, yeah, no, he would, he would definitely impress me. I think he's ready for a title shot whenever Golden Boy wants to get him one. The only hey, thing babe. that I imagine is standing in the way is um, them not necessarily being able to pay the, the big money for some of those fights to happen. But whenever he's, uh, whenever they get him one, I think he's ready. Except for, except for uh, Valdez, I wouldn't favor him in that fight. But hey, babe, but actually, guys, I thought, I thought that this time around he showed a lot of good head movement, Naota. And you know, me and you kind of been That's critical on what Jojo I just said. for eating a lot of fucking punches, bro. Especially coming with these older vets that just, you know, that are just in the gridiron, just taking punches and shit, you know. But he did look fucking sharp as fuck, dog. I mean, him and and uh, uh, what is the other guy's name? The other De La Hoya, Diego De La Hoya. Man, these two guys, if Golden Boy plays their cards right, they should just put those two on um, Canelo's undercards from here on out and build them up because, you know, those guys don't really got any fighters and just leave everybody else on those, like, Velasco cards or those new Olympic guys and just build them up like that. For me, like, I'm, I'm not really going to Diego, man. Like, he's never really impressed me every time I see him. He, he just always seems kind of average. 
And he, I don't know, it seems like Golden Boy are taking his time bringing him up now. I think he's had like about 15 fights now. And I don't think the, he's really been stepped up. Or, even though they were saying that this uh, Orlando Develo was like a bit of a step up. Like, I don't know. I just, I, I, well, he he was because uh, De Valle was, um, you know, he was a highly touted prospect a few years ago until he ran into Victor Chini and got outpointed there. But, I mean, it was kind of, you know, uh, I guess a test of, you know, old prospect versus young new prospect. And I, I thought he did really well because considering the fact that he basically dominated De Valle, which is something that even really Darchinian didn't do back when they fought. Um, and that, this was back when Vic was still, you know, like an elite level fighter, elite level contender. But um, Diego, to me, it has always generally been more impressive than Diaz has because I thought that they, they've had a few opponents in common and to me Diego was already was always beating them more impressively than Jojo had been and I, I think too. I think whenever they they choose to step him up to the elite level to you know when try to go after a world title he'll be just as ready if not more so than Jojo is yeah him versus Jojo will be a crazy fight in the near future but I'm talking about this might be like three four years in the making you know yeah, well, they are different weights at the moment, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, th- I feel the opposite. Like Jojo's always really impressed me, and Diego's just always looked average. But I guess we'll uh, agree to disagree. But the Diego, with for me, he's more. He's a technical puncher, though. Uh, Jojo is more. He's a he's a technical guy, but he's just like his his punches don't go with a lot of power. That's the one thing he lacks. It's like a lot of power, but Diego, that motherfucker could crack. I don't know. I don't know. All right. Anything else regarding this pay per view? No, I mean that was pretty it. I do like though that um, you know Golden Boy, as as per usual, recently anyway, that they had the full undercard. They had like all the you know the deep undercard fights on on their YouTube on Golden Boy Boxing. Yeah, so I, did I, like I, I like I like, I like that, and Salam I think Ali that fight? anybody and everybody should have all of their undercards either on YouTube or streaming in some fashion because it's just entertaining to be able to watch a lot of these guys that are, you know, still in development and uh, on their way up. No, it, it is good. I didn't know about that until afterwards, but, you know, it, it does kind of get you ready for the for the main pay-per-view card if you're starting to watch a few fights a bit earlier. And there was a really mm-hmm. good um, knockout, knockout win as well. I don't know the name of the guy, but someone posted it. Joshua Twitter. Franco. Yeah, that was a nice. Was that uppercut stoppage? I think it was. Yeah, yeah. He li- he lifted the dude off the ground with that uppercut and just you know leveled him. Really, Any, really impressive stuff from him. Anybody catch the Saddam Ali fight or not? Nah? No, yeah, didn't. yeah. He didn't look what? all that great. Nah, he didn't, bro. He didn't look all that great. I was like, I think I look. think Jesse snatched that soul. Hell yeah, man. <laughs> that that overhand right, he snatched it. All right, let's move on. Talk about Usyk and Glowski on Saturday. Sky picked it up, which was good for us over here in the UK. But I don't know. I said last week, I'm not the biggest Glowski fan. I think he's quite basic, and Usyk made him look quite basic early on. I thought Usyk was showing him a lot of respect, and you know, he was just using a jab and a lot of movement, just um, dancing around the ring. And I thought Glowski. Um, was competitive up until like the sixth round. I think I had it like three three going, you know, into the seventh. But after that, for me, Usyk kind of took over and um, he started putting combinations together. I think he kind of, you know, he, he showed Glowski a bit of respect. He wanted to kind of see, you know, give him give him a few rounds to see what he's got, and he didn't really see much in Glowski. And then then he started putting punches together a bit. I know. I saw a comment from Kimo. I think he was trolling, but you never know with Kimo sometimes. And he was like kind of shitting on Usyk a bit, but because you know, like we've kind of referred to him as a beast previously. And I, like I said, I think he was just showing him a bit of respect. He was, you know, fighting the champion. He was like nine and zero, um, fighting in the champion's home country. So, you know. Mm-hmm. He, well, and to be honest, I thought that he started to turn it up after a few rounds, really try to put some power on those shots. It's just that Glovaki has a good chin, and what he was doing from in the first place and now boxing him was so effective, he kind of just went right back to it in the later rounds. As um, Glovaki, once he started to find some range, he started landing a little bit here and there, and I think that it became more of like a better safe than sorry type deal 
for uh, Usyk in the later rounds and tr- just trying to outbox him to a clean decision because he had swept so many of the early rounds that Glovaki by the by the later rounds was going to need a knockout in order to win, and he was you know becoming increasingly increasingly desperate for it to the extent where when he kind of th- pushed him down he landed that big like overhand right as he was going down so. Um, you know, that, that could have ended a lot worse for Usyk had he not kept on his P's and Q's. Yeah, like, after the sixth, seventh round for me, um, Glowski was just looking for that, you know, the, the big overhand or the big left hand, both being south post, and he was just looking for it too much. And it's it's easy to make the comparison with Lomachenko with them being friends, both being Ukrainian, both being south post, but... For such a big dude, he is so light on his feet, man. And some of his footwork was excellent. He did that little sidestep like Loma does, and just you know smacks you with the left hand, and then then he's gone again. It's just it's just nice yeah. to watch. Well, yeah, like you that, could man. you could tell that they both come from the same you know school of training. This, uh, you know they were both trained by the same people. Yeah, in their in the amateur program and stuff. So they definitely both took to that style and have uh, made the most of it. Definitely. What do you think now, Leo, to just a couple of defenses and then hopefully some type of unifications in the cruiserweight or what? Um, well, I mean, yeah, at cruiserweight, it's kind of a funny situation because you imagine, you'd imagine, you know, the big money's going to be coming at heavyweight for him. And, you know, obviously he, he could hold the weight well considering he's fought at super heavy, you know, as it's known in the amateurs before uh, a few times. So it's one of those things where it's really just going to be about, like, who who's out there for him in terms of uh, big pay. And also, I guess, in terms of pro development, in terms of, you know, fully fleshing out his style as a professional. And then once um, once the, you know, the pro heavyweight division kind of sorts itself out in the near future, then they'll start picking who they want to fight in terms of, you know, the biggest money available. So I'd imagine we might see him against, you know, somebody like a Marco Huck or, you know, maybe even like somebody like Cunningham um, sometime in the near future just because of, you know, name value. But um, I, I'd imagine maybe like within a couple of defenses, he'll probably wind up moving up to the full heavyweight division and try to fight against, you know, well, any of the title lists, regardless of who it is. Yeah, I, I think he should just remain at Cruiser, man, because there he's, he, he's with similar sized guys. Even though, like you said, he can hold it with bigger dudes, I think just stay there. Because Cruiser is a very competitive division, man. I think well, have... I'd imagine what would happen would he he'd probably keep his belt and he'd probably stay probably in range maybe like only go up to like about two ten or so, and you know just kind of test the waters and yeah if it doesn't work out for him then he could go right back to cruising. Not kind of do a Cunningham, just don't get too big and then you step back down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, Hamadi, did you catch this fight? Yes, I did. What's your thoughts? I was very underwhelmed. I was told that this Usk guy is a beast. And it, he's not a beast. He's a very talented fighter. Got incredible footwork for a guy his size. He's, what, 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, and being that heavy to have that kind of movement is very, very impressive. You know, it's very rare to see someone he's six that three. size. He looks... Well, he looked much bigger than... Maybe Garak is just very short then because he looked much taller. He's very talented. He's got good good footwork. It, it, I like how he keeps his hands really high. He's, he reminds me a bit like Winky Wacky. He has some really long forearms because like his hands are that high and it's still quite... His elbows are quite far down as well at the same time. So he's got a good high guard. I don't know. I don't like... His punching technique, though, it seems a bit pity patty, if you get what I'm trying to say, you know. Or maybe he just. He, he looked like to me that he's one of those fighters that always, like, thinks about the exit. So he's not sitting there to plant his feet and, you know, punch through you. He just wants to hit you and escape. You get what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Like, he always has his exit route planned before he lets his hands go. And he's got a nice. Yeah, that's a. Nice, that's a that's a lot of that amateur styling, you know, the, the scoring yeah. points technique. He's got a decent job. I don't know. He, towards later in the fight, he wasn't really throwing the left hand much. 
But he, he's he's very talented. He's a very talented fighter, but a beast. No, I don't think he's a beast. Um, I was told things like he's going to go up to heavyweight and beat every heavyweight. And he, he was I, he was telling you this. <laughs> I don't know. This, this is what people have been saying. This is what the stuff I read on Twitter and all sorts. I mean, I don't know. This is the sort of stuff I was saying. I like, literally and I saw his record nine and oh nine KOs. I just thought, you know. Another Kovalev, another Triple G. Uh, like I would even compare it to Lomachenko because obviously Lomachenko is a, a lot smaller, so he, he's able to do things that Usk will be able to do because obviously he's much bigger physically. But he is very talented. He's a very talented fighter. He, he'll be difficult to beat. But Glowacki was very disappointing. Very disappointing. I don't know how you people found rounds to give him. I mean, well, I got I got to mention this. Sorry, but Gregor's Prosca is still fucked up from that beating. You know? <laughs> like his scorecard was awful. What did he have? A draw? I think he had a draw. No, no, you, you, no, I no, think he, he had a. He was sick winning. Um, he like had a round two points. I think he had, had like one eighteen, one sixteen, or some shit like that. Some some crazy nonsense. Yeah, he, yeah, he had two even rounds, and so like that wound up making it like. Way closer. Yeah, it, it was like uh, Usyk won that round, but I don't want to go against my countrymen, so I'll give it a ten. Yeah, exactly. 10. Yo, GGG's power is real, man. Like I'm telling you, man, he fucked up Proxa, man. Like, Proxa <laughs> uh, pro- probably had some some dudes basically saying like, "Oh yeah, you better give him all the close rounds, or else." And I was been... I was a bit worried as well, you know, because there was a long gap between the announcement of the winner. Like Jimmy Lennon was yeah, there, but like shit. I think man. he knew though. He he looked like if you if you want the definition of a beaten man, like when Sky kept showing Glowacki after the fight, literally that was a man beaten. Like, I, and I don't know when they were going in, when they were just about to start. He looked really nervous as well. I, I just think Glowacki just you know handed over the towel, man. It was a poor showing from him. He he weren't letting his hands go. I know. Yeah, like uh, yeah, just like the Rosado right? Monroe thing. Just like the Rosado Monroe thing. Similar type of situation. Good I know, I know, open I know, up enough. I know Usyk has great footwork, and you know it's obviously going to be difficult to to throw because obviously he's always offsetting you with the footwork. But I mean, just the lack of effort, and then towards the end of the fight, it, it seemed like he just tried to prove a point by dropping his hands and taking shots for free. Like the lucky, I mean. At times, Usk would land like a four-punch combination and Glowacki wouldn't even move. He wouldn't even bring his hands up. It's just taking shots for free. And it was just... I just thought Glowacki's performance was terrible, if you ask. I don't know how people gave it to him. I think I, I, at most, you could, I, I don't know, man. Like I just saw Usk just dominate round after round after round. And it, to be honest, it was easy for Usk, really and truly. Yeah, I, I only I, I only give Glovaki three rounds, but like they were early on, and it was when there wasn't much in the round. Like Usyk would have like success in the first part of the round, and then Glovaki would have a bit towards the end. But I think he had it like one seventeen, one eleven, or something like that. So it wasn't a close fight. But yeah, I was really disappointed with the Glovaki as well. Yeah, it was poor performance. I I was very disappointed. Especially like showing the kind of the performance because I didn't see his fight with Cunningham, but I watched the Huck fight. Like the way like he was down on the cards in that fight, and he went for broke and ended up knocking out Huck. Like you know, I thought we we we'd at least see something from him, but we saw nothing, man. He, he just disappointing performance. But who uh, skated the finished article by no stretch? I mean, I think. Because he, he has an advantage over these other cruiserweights. I mean, he's got that excellent footwork. I think he can afford not to sit and trade, but to sit, to, to proper dig into his punches. Do you know what I mean? Because he's, fa- he's faster than all these guys. Uh, the, the, all these cruiserweights will be similar to Goraki. You know, they'll, they'll all be like kind of flat footed, you know, whereas he's the complete opposite. So. It'd be interesting to see him fight against these other cruiserweights, man. Because there's a lot of good cruiserweights. The, the one, the one guy I think could potentially give him trouble would be uh, Unie Torico, because uh, he's, you know, he's pretty light on his feet and he's a big puncher. He's he had a fight of the year earlier this year. He's a fighter from Cuba. He's the interim WBA champion. 
Okay, well. But you know, know guys. what? Watch, watch his fight with Yori Kalenga. It was uh, one of the f- best fights of the year. Really oh, good two, fight oh yeah, the one in front. The, yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that fight. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Hamada, just to like go off what you were saying, that like, with Usyk, I just think to Naoto's point and my point earlier, where I just thought he was, you know, um, he was given Glowacki respect, and to Naoto's point where. Um, what he was doing was working so I think he was playing it safe as well you know being in Poland being against the champion I think those combination of things is maybe why he didn't try and you know step it up and try and get him out of there but that's just he tried a few times but I just think he realised that like I think in the 11th and the 10th and the 11th he tried to actually you know put his foot down and try I don't stop. I, I think, think he just, just, just wasn't getting anywhere with him. I think yeah, he just, so you just I, thought you know what? There's no point. Yeah, yeah, I think he might be being a bit overcritical, to be honest. No, because obviously, I, I, like I said, I was underwhelmed. I mean, I was told this this guy is the best thing since sliced bread, and yeah, no, but sometimes you know what, what you read on Twitter, you got to kind of you know not always yeah, put full um, full thought into it, but. Um, let's move on, Neil, to talk about another fight of the year candidate. Like we've had so many in the last couple of weeks, man. Uh, Yamanaka versus Moreno, man. I watched that today, and it was a very fun fight. Yeah, I mean, a great fight. And see, the one thing I think that it has that most of the other fight of the year candidates, aside from the one that I just mentioned, Doriko and Kalenga had, was conclusiveness. You know, uh, Yamanaka was eventually able to stop Moreno. You know, drop him hard with couple of those left hands uh, eventually in the in the ninth round and just made it uh, I mean it was a great fight you know Moreno came out he was piecing up Yamanaka early in the very first round and then at the very end of the round Yamanaka just hits him with a big left hand you know they're, they're both southpaws he hits him with a big overhand left over a, a like a right um, hook to the body that Moreno was throwing just chin checks him and drops him almost on his face, you know, and it was like that pretty much throughout the whole fight. A lot of shifts and tide. It was almost, it reminded me a little bit like Prince Nassim versus Kevin Kelly, and how they kept trading, either being hurt or being knocked down. And it was really a great fight between those two. And um, I, I, I like, that's definitely one that I would consider you maybe top three or the fight of the year, because just like I said, you know, the, the conclusiveness of it. And also the fact that, I mean, it was for the, uh, essentially like the lineal title number one versus number two at bantamweight and then the the fact that i mean it was just a, a great fight all the way around each round b- both guys were doing good work um both uh like look at the land a big power hand the power left hand behind the jab and th- they both found a home for it you know consistently and um cleanly and it just ended with uh Yamanaka managing to catch Moreno more than Moreno was able to catch him. But even with that, you know, there were a lot of times where Moreno would get hurt, then in the follow-up, Yamanaka would get hurt because he left himself a little too open. So, I mean, it was just a a brilliant clash of styles and a fight that definitely exceeded the first, which is kind of a rarity as well. Yeah, for me, I think I'd have to put out fight of the year that I've seen so far just because previously my fight of the year would have probably been Jamie Conley versus... uh, Anthony Nelson, but that was kind of like a domestic mm-hmm. fight. That it had the twos and throws and ending with a knockout, but it was at a lower level. But these two guys are high level. Um, there's a world title that's at stake, and there was so much to and fro in. Like, like you said, Morano was down in the first, then he put down Yamanaka down in the fourth, and then he almost put him down in the fifth with a similar punch. But, yeah. you know, uh, Yamanaka stayed on his feet, his glove didn't touch. And then the tide turned again with all the knockdowns towards the end of the fight. And some of those uh, some of those straight lefts down the pipe that Yamanaka was hitting Moreno with, man, and dropping him, man, it was... Just, yeah, that, 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 that knockdown that he scored in the sixth was probably the nicest of all of them. Because, like, literally, literally landed at the same time. Yeah. yeah, Moreno landed a right, and Yamanaka landed a left cross, but that cross was just, it was just harder. Like, you know, it was just the difference of leverage. And you could see, like, if you pause it, like, right in the video, right at the right spot, you'll see sweat flying off both of their heads. And, yeah. yeah. You know, Moreno just went back, and then you see, like, the, his eyes bugging out of his head like he just got hit by a truck. Yeah. And at that point, I, I felt like, oh, man, this is going to be over. But he managed to survive into the next round, surprisingly. Yeah, yeah. And but apart then that, from that, that, that... That last knockdown, though... Um, I was going to say, apart from that last knockdown, knockdown, you know, like, yeah. 
Moreno showed a lot of heart, man. He kept getting up, kept yeah. like uh, punching his fist together, like, come on, let's go. Like, he's not, he wasn't a guy that was just going to think, you know what, I've been knocked multiple times, I'm just going to quit now. Like, he wanted to keep going, man. Yeah. That's the yeah, type man, of fight the, you want to see. The second, the second to last one was nasty because the thing is, he hit him with the left hand, and then as he was falling, he hit him with the right hook as well, like high on the head. That's the one that laid him flat on his back. But he even got up from that one. But at that point, it was just a matter of time because he had taken so much cumulative damage on top of that big that big little combo right there that he got hit with before he hit the canvas. Um, that was pretty much the beginning and the end. And, you know, it's like uh, they, they mentioned in the chat, you know, nobody had even done that to Moreno before. You know, the only, like, clear decision loss that Moreno had had before was um, the one to Abner Mars years back. You know, and that was a super band of weight, you know, and that was to a pound for pound level fighter. And, you know, of course, you know, Yamanak is probably in those rankings really now um, more solidified than he had been before. But at the same time, you know, just the fact that he managed to do something no other fighter had done um, put an exclamation mark on this fight as compared to the first fight. And um, just the, the overall action in the fight just makes it just, a, you know, just a fun one to watch. Definitely one for the one for the um, the ages, you know. At any Yamanaka hits hard. <laughs> <laughs> Joe and Hamada, I doubt you guys saw this fight. Nah, but I just wanted to say that Yamanaka hits hard. <laughs> uh, Neota, yep. I didn't catch the. I seen really... it. I seen it, man. No way. What'd you think? I didn't see the whole, the full fight. I just saw like the knockdowns and stuff on you on the the YouTube. Yeah, the highlights on Twitter. <laughs> that was savage. Like, Moreno got up from some savage left hands, man. Yeah. Like, it was one that, like, literally knocked him halfway across the ring. <laughs> into the rope. Yeah, yeah, that's and the one I was talking up. about. That was savage, man. I think and that's even the... Yamanaka was getting dropped and knocked into the ropes. It was... I, I was so surprised that that Moreno could, be, could even be in a fight like that. Because... Moreno ain't he a boxer like he moves around he uses jab and stuff like that like he's not he's not known to be in wars like this yeah he's a lot more of a defensive slick type fighter you like probably only this fight the first fight with Yamanaka and the um, one not even really the first fight with Yamanaka was more of a jab fest between the two of them but like between this fight and the Mars fight were the only two that he's really had like a real like action fight where it's like there's a lot of you know just like big punches being landed, a lot of damage being done. His stance is so wide, though, man. So wide, and it just, it just is so unhelpful, you know, if you're trying to get out of, you know, punches range or evade yeah. punches. Well, because a lot of what he tries to do is almost like Pernod Whitaker, where he's just trying to bend at the waist and, you know, really dick and up, you know, duck, dip, and dive and dodge, you know, like dodgeball. And, and, you know, he's usually just trying to trying to do a lot of, like, torso and head movement, you know, rolling around, bobbing and weaving in order to evade shots as opposed to using his feet. Yeah. Um, Naoto, I didn't see the Ruiz Hasegawa fight, so if you want to give your thoughts, if not, we can move on. Well, I mean, it was really an impressive victory for Hasegawa. You know, I expected Ruiz to knock him out, basically, but the, the reverse happened. Um, I think probably helped partially due to the fact that they had a head clash in the first round that it looked like it broke uh, Ruiz's nose because his nose looked all jacked up after that. But Hasegawa, like, he had that target to aim at and he, and he kept aiming at it and he landed his left hand pretty consistently on it to the extent where I think he he just damaged his nose so bad that, you know, Ruiz eventually just retired on his stool, which is really surprising, you know, I mean, considering the fact that Ruiz had shown, you know, some pretty good heart against Julio Ceja, you know, and coming back in the rematch and stopping him. But then again, he also avoided the the third fight with Ceja, which is really a fight that everybody should have been clamoring for. And, you know, that, you know, he kind of got what he deserved in that, in that sense, because of the fact that, you know, he took uh, the bigger money for, you know, to fight Hasegawa, a guy that's, you know, an old veteran, a guy that was, you know, Japan's premier fighter years ago, like eight, about eight or so years ago, he was, you know, the number one fighter out of Japan and managed to come back and win himself another title. And it's kind of funny because he actually may possibly retire off of this win, but I, I'd imagine the money will be there for him to fight one of the other top super bantams, um, regardless of who it is, you know, possibly say, uh, possibly Ray Vargas, who's been the mandatory for a cool minute now, or possibly like Diego De La Hoya, as I mentioned earlier, you know, who I think is ready for a top level fight. And somebody like, Hasegawa, who's uh, a pretty vulnerable elder type 
champion, a guy that has a lot of um, accomplishments behind him, but also has a lot of weaknesses in the ring, would be um, a pretty good step up in that case. But you know, he's a guy that's you know got pretty quick hands, uh, quick feet, and you know he's he's a, he can be dangerous in his own right, as he as he proved against Ruiz. So. Um, you know, just props to Hasegawa for that one. You know, he managed to to pull off a a, a bit of a Bernard Hopkins type um, win over a, a guy that seemed like a dangerous young foe for him to be fighting against. With Ruiz, Malta, did... sorry, go. Oh, sorry, I was gonna say Malta. Who did you say was mandatory? Ray Vargas. Oh, because I read something on Twitter that um, Gavin McDonald is in the in line to get a shot at that belt. Yeah, yeah, he's the he's ranked number two. Right, the top three are Ray Vargas, Gavin McDonald, and Julio Cea. That's why. So is it is he the proper mandatory? Or did he he's not. Have, uh, he's they, not. They, well, they haven't they haven't named him like um, they haven't done that. You know, where they name him and then you have to like come to an agreement within ninety days or whatever. They haven't done that yet. Oh. He's basically been the number one contender all this time. So that could hey, I got be a like. Question. I got a good question. How the fuck do you say Golden Boy in Japanese? Because that's what that motherfucker needs to do. He needs to go to Japan and get them motherfucking fighters, dog. I don't know what you're talking about, Joe, so we'll just move on. No matter what you yeah, say. Yeah, I was saying, um, I could see Quig, you know, getting a shot at him. Them offering that guy a bucket load of money and Quig's looking for a fight, innit? And, you know, try to get him a quick belt. I could see Matt Trim pulling off because... I saw somewhere that Quig was gonna fight um for his old belt. Who's he gonna who's got his old belt? Oh, the, Jonathan Guzman. Oh yeah, no the, Guzman. No, Guzman, the what's it called, man? The the regular. Someone else, man. Uh, what his name? Yeah, Guzman's got IBF in it. I think it's he's from one of those. Oh, you're talking about Semenyo. Oh, talking about Neo, Neo Mar Semenyo. Semenyo. I think he won't be Semenyo, man. You don't think so? Nah. Semenyo's too slick. Probably, but apparently he was going to look for him, so maybe they might just go for Hasegawa, because Hasegawa is old, and he did lose to Martinez not long ago, didn't he? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Was, you, what's your, what's of, all the, of all the titles at 122, Hasegawa, I would consider it the, uh, the easiest to... What's your to thoughts see? on him traveling, though, even though he's a vet? They still get good money over in Japan. Do you think he would come over to the UK to fight? It really all depends on how much they offer him. You know, he he's probably he'll probably get, I'd imagine seven hundred, eight hundred thousand. You know, Shit, for his next fight in Japan. You know, it. You know, the, especially on New Year's. So, the, you know, they they better be willing to open uh, up that check. Uh, Hearn's definitely not getting him over here, and he's not paying that much money. And the tight cunt, but Quig's next fight's on AJ's undercard. So you never know. He might, he might stomp up the money. AJ might bring in, because AJ brings in the cash. Nah, man. Quig's fighting it, boom. And then he's going to start calling out Frampton again. I know. Have you seen that he's been talking a lot about Frampton lately? Yeah, he wants that rematch, but I don't think he deserves you it. He don't deserve it. Fuck off. With that, he did nothing for the first six rounds. And then, <laughs> oh, Majo went, Majo went. No, your jaw got broken. Stupid idiot. I mean, fuck's sake. All right, let's quickly have a break. Give all the people in the chat a name check. We have African Shark, Steve Kim, Tony Yeo, BSH 316, Beast Mode, Pinhead 360, J-Speed the A-Side, Larry Magoo, PM Versus, Shams 1000, Basileos, Nothing for Something, Bill Bones 101, Nunez 83, Die Hard Casual Fan, Loco Mexican, Mr. Dermo, BRD Hay, Overbruv, Mongo Sled, Kevlar and seven guests. Any news you guys want to talk about? I know, um, Hamada, you posted something in the chat earlier. Was it Conlon signing with the uh, top rank, Michael Conlon? Yeah, the infamous guy from the Olympics. I was putting his middle finger up at everyone signed yeah. for top rank. What's your thoughts on that? I'm, like, I'm surprised that the American promotions have gone in for him. Um, I don't know. Maybe they're trying to. Well, he's Irish, isn't it? Yeah. They'll probably just build him in, you know, that American-Irish market. Probably. I don't know, man. I'm not even too well, bothered with, with promotional 
things top and rank, stuff like you know fans. Top rank has kind of a thing for Olympians, so it's not entirely surprising. But I am kind of surprised that um, one of the British promoters didn't pick him up before. Well, Warren has got his brother, so I thought maybe that might be the obvious, um, the obvious person to pick up. Because you can just do like joint yeah. shows in Ireland, so I'm surprised that didn't happen. Yeah, well, well, and speaking, Paddy, Paddy Bond sign with uh, someone today. MGM. Oh, I'm oh. so sorry for Paddy Bond. Man. Paddy's <laughs> gonna be taking them out. <laughs> MGM Marbella, man. Yep, that's. Uh... That's why that's why Liam Smith took a beating, man, because he got MGM on his clothes. But did you notice as well? Liam Smith is sponsored by Alessi. Like, who the fuck wears Alessi these days? <laughs> it's true. Well, I, don't even, I don't even know what Alessi is. Is that like an old school? Yeah, it's like an old school brand? sports brand. I think they're originally Italian, but I think they're owned by a British company. But like, no one wears them anymore. Like when I was in my teens, like people were wearing them, but not now. Like, like almost like Fila. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I had like. <laughs> A pair of uh, LSE trainers when I was like nine years old. Used to be like, so remember, like, yeah, feel like over here, like feel like used to be the shit back in the day. Or like LA gear, that was another one. Yeah, I'm about having some LA gear. That oh, British, Brit- Brit- British Knights, BK, BK Knights. Yeah, I had some of them as well. <laughs> shit, man, this is the this is the sneaker coalition now. <laughs> exactly. But, nah, but yeah, no, nah, Petty Petty Barnes. Um, I, they're saying that he wants to turn pro at flyweight honestly if i was him i would try to go as low as possible because i think the as the zosha ming showed you know the level of opposition at flyweight is a lot tougher than you know a lot of people give credit for and um you know like zo you know he was used to making 108 on fight day so i don't know why he would really want to you know risk um going at at going at like at a possible strength disadvantage along with you know the potential um, skill set not necessarily matching up with some of those guys like a like a Casimero or, or Kazuto Yoka, but I don't know. It's, uh, it'll be interesting to see how far he goes because at least now um, Estrada and Gonzalez have pretty much uh, left the flyweight division, so there might be a little bit more of an opening for him. Um, and that was the other piece of news I wanted to mention. Estrada officially vacated his uh, his WBA and WBO titles because he wants to uh, try to go after a title at Super Flyweight, and they're trying to petition the WBC to make a fight between him and Carlos Cuadras in order to make the winner the final eliminator, like uh, number one contender mandatory for Roman Gonzalez. So if that fight comes off, I mean, that's a, that's big props to uh, to Estrada for basically going out after what looks like the most dangerous fighter at the weight class and in order to try and get a rematch with his old foe, you know, trying to make, you know, the potential biggest fight at the weight class or anywhere around the weight class happen. You know, that, I think that that would definitely be um, two incredible fights to see, regardless of whoever wins them. Yep. Another piece of news I saw was Eubank Jr. pulling out of the fight with Tommy Langford for the British title and vacating it, Come saying he's got an elbow injury or something, but I don't know, it just seems a bit shady to me, man, because... And Definitely. I saw a, a big rant video on IFL with Warren, and he made some really good points, man. You know, people have bought tickets to the fight. You know, there's coaches going down from, I don't know, the, the Midlands down to Cardiff. You know. You know what, Cam? Yeah, I I agree, but only now Frank Warren seems to care about that stuff. True. No, that that is true, but it's. It's frustrating. Like, obviously, I've not bought a ticket to that shit, but I couldn't. It's it's frustrating when you're looking forward to something, you spent money on something. Now, they're saying that maybe Eubank Juniors had the the injury, you know, inspected by a doctor that's approved by the British Boxing Board and this and that and whatever. But I don't know. The statement he was made was quite ignorant. Like, oh, he doesn't want to be hurting any more, like British level middleweights. Well, well. You, you, you didn't mind doing it before when you wanted to win the British title, so what difference does it make and, now? And who was his last fight against? Sorry, I forgot. Who was it against? It, well, you, you're being ironic, are you actually asking? No, but honestly, he, he fought Tom Doran, like, isn't, isn't that dangerous? Exactly. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. See, the I, U-Bikes, I, I swear down, see the u here, they're full of shit, man. The thing like, is, the, honestly. the feeling I used to get with Fury where I'm kind of losing my patience with him, I've kind of let losing it with like Eubank as well like he does all the talking but then his actions don't represent what his mouth's saying we don't we don't own towels yeah well 
You don't own a penny, bro. Like, what do you own? Like, <laughs> you don't have no pride. You have no dignity. Like, they made this big deal, yeah, about, oh, the Lonsdale belt and, oh, the British title. And, and all of a sudden now they're vacating it saying, we don't want to hurt British British guys that are not on our level. Like, oh, the new banks are a fucking mess, man. And I'm, they're, just, they're an embarrassment, honestly, like, to, to boxing. And I don't know, man. I, I don't even want to really get started on the Eubanks because I'll just go off and say some bad things about them and I don't even want to do that. Neil to Schemas, you guys got any opinion? <sighs> I just want to see the man in the ring, man. You Eubanks is the king of Snapchat right now next to DJ Khaled. They're, 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 they're making... They're making things really hard on themselves because um, even like Golovkin's people were saying like that quote those clowns lost their shot. So I mean, good luck to them getting you know a big fight in the near future, considering the fact that they're making a very bad reputation for themselves in terms of um, being able to actually deal with people on a professional level. Yeah, I don't think, did you not that's, see that's that interview, bad, man? That's pretty did you not bad see on that? them. Sorry, did you see that, that interview where they were basically, you know, saying things about Kel Brook and how he quit and how we're warriors and we fight till the end? Yeah. And you know what, they, they quit, they quit shit, before they started. <laughs> Hamada, I watched a bit of it, but I had to turn it off, man, because it's, it's, it's difficult. It's graceful. Yeah, it's terrible. I mean, for fuck, this is the stuff I hate. And then... All right, cool. You giving it all that hard talk. Oh, tennis elbow shouldn't be a big shouldn't be a big deal. I mean, you should be able to beat Tommy Lagford with with tennis elbow, don't you think? I mean, you're warriors. You fight to the end, no matter what happens. Like, don't you think? And then in the statement, yeah, he was sparring with like a fourteen stone dude, and he picked up the elbow injury. Like, why do you have to mention he was sparring with a fourteen stone dude? And like, and and why are you sparring with a 14 stone dude? Now, obviously, you know, the guy's got a big weight advantage on you. It's just, you know, everything they say and do, man, it's just fucking... Oh, it's getting really frustrating. And a good job, probably, Leon's not here because he's a big fan of the Eubanks, but I, I think he'd even find it hard to defend them these days. Mm, you must be very mindful. <laughs> <laughs> S- ski mask. Yo, only chemo can do the, the senior impression. <laughs> Yo, man, but Eubanks is a fucking bum, dude. Man, I can't stand that guy. I that love guy. watching him fight. He's exciting to watch fight, but, you know, everything out of the ring, all the antics, all the comments, it's just unneeded. Yeah, he's <laughs> a fool. I don't know if he's doing this shit on Skimas, Skimas impression of Eubanks sounded like fucking Siri on my iPhone, man. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, he's lost all credibility. Like, Eubanks is... The U Banks have no credibility, like zero. Like promoters don't probably don't want to go nowhere near him. The fans think they're a laughing stock. Even though they probably do have a few diehards who, you know obviously everybody has diehard fans, but uh they're just they're just a lot they have to be like the biggest joke in boxing right they're now. They're burning so many bridges as well because Warren's not gonna work with him. You know, Hearns Unlikely to work with him unless you know the the money's right or the or the opportunity's right. Um, nah, it's not gonna happen. The Hennessy, way Hearn's thrown H- them under the bus, like yeah, H- Hennessy's not gonna work with him. The only thing they could probably do is go to an American promoter or do what like David Hay did and do his own show with Dave and you know do his own promotion and stuff. But I could actually see that happening because they are quite egotistical and that would kind of work for them because it seemed to work for David Hay as well because he did get the figures on Dave and he did kind of put the bums in the seats at the O2 Arena. So maybe mm. that might be the way they're going to go. No one the car is just Eubank. Exactly. Just like music and then Eubank. <laughs> That's fucking garbage, oh, dude. Yeah, man. I, I I was watching some of that stuff on YouTube, like Frank Warren, uh, like that promoter. I guess he's like, what, Box Nation, right? Yeah. Yeah, that guy was just shitting on him and shitting on his dad so hard. Like, man, this guy's a fucking idiot. You know, he's glad that he's out, out of, like, doing business with them. And then you just had a couple, like, uh, weeks back, you know, you had Eddie Hearn, like, like Hamada said, was just shitting on him. Like, real tough, you know, all the negotiations, how that guy wanted this, wanted that. The commentators on the... Man, that's, that's, these people are fucking nuts, dude. Like, 
how the fuck did they expect to fight anybody like remotely good, you know? And and, and calling all these shots, dude. Like if they're like the A side, you know? Like what? It, what? It, what happens if they want to fight like a Lemieux with like Golden Boy or some shit, you know? Or like or fight like a Danny Jacobs like on on the PBC side of the road, you know? Uh, fucking Kid Chocolate, and they're making all these fucking landish demands, dude. Like it ain't gonna get them nowhere, man. I actually think the next step will be the states. They're gonna have to now because, like I said, they built so many bridges over here. But yep, let's move on. Any other news, guys? I, you you guys want to discuss? I think he has to go to fucking Argentina, bro. We don't want him over here in the states. <laughs> <laughs> Any other news you guys want to discuss? Nah, that's, I'm I'm done. All right, I'm let's uh, let's preview Corolla versus Linares. And initially, when I decided to go to this fight, you know, I was thinking you know, it's going to be a really good fight, but been watching a bit more Linares and I'm worried it may turn into like Kroll of Dali's Perez fight one because I think it might be quite technical quite a jab fest and I hope I'm wrong but yeah I don't think it's going to turn into a great fight because obviously Kroll is a Gallagher trained fighter and high guard and left it to the body and you know it's it's a recipe that doesn't always give you good fights so Naota what's your thoughts um well I mean you might be right in a certain sense I imagine early on it'll probably be like that but I I also imagine after a few rounds um the two of them will you know they'll, they'll start really letting hands fly the thing is Lenares is a guy that you know as as good he is, as he is technically he is willing to really put himself on the line you know he he's a guy that He's unlike Amir Khan, he never really lost that fire in terms of his offense. So he's looking to really like style on you and throw a lot of different combinations out there and really, you know, make things fun to watch, incidentally. So I think um, I, regardless of whether it winds up being technical for the most part or just technical early and then, you know, fireworks start popping off after a few rounds, yeah. I think it'll be fun to watch because, um, you know, I think Linares is always a fun fighter to watch offensively. The way he's able to just put punches together is something that you don't see uh, especially often. And then um, Krola, I imagine if he's really – if he starts really dropping a lot of early rounds to Linares, is really going to have to force himself out of his comfort zone and uh, put more pressure and just uh, attack a bit more. And so we, we might get some pretty interesting exchanges as it gets into the mid to late rounds. So um, I'm still looking forward to the fight. I think it'll be interesting, especially once the two of them manage to get settled into in terms of their time and rhythm. Hamada, your thoughts? Uh, sorry, I was just on mute. Um, I remember when the fight got signed um I spoke to a few people, even last, was it last week when I was at the Broke Girls game, I told Brian and them that I think Crawler's catching Lenares at the right time. I think Lenares is on the slide right now. But I'm, I'm going to take Lenares to beat him though. I've changed my mind. I think someone with Lenares' style normally gives Gallagher fighters issues. So I think Lenares is going to be too, too, too classy for him with the jab, the one twos, the the intangibles, the, the, the left hooks, you know, the uppercut left hooks, just the different types of barriers of punches which the Gallagher fighters seem not to know how to deal with. You know, they just seem to just they're really basic fighters. They, you know, they they they're just one two left hook to the body, tap upstairs left hook to the body there. They're very basic in what they do, the Gallagher fighters. And I think when you've got someone who actually has a bag of tricks, normally that's that's their downfall. Linares has got decent footwork as well, but Linares is a bit like Nelson did say. He is a bit of a fiery guy. He could, You could catch him in exchanges, but I don't think P- Crawler has power like that, especially... You know, now that Crawler, you know, a lot of people are suggesting he's on roids and stuff like that. I, I, I'm not sure, but he has been stopping guys, but mainly to the body. I don't think Crawler would have that kind of power upstairs to the head where Lenares is most vulnerable. So I could just see Lenares probably sneaking a push. And Lenares does punch really hard, you know. We, we have to remember, like, you know, against Mitchell, he, he, I know Mitchell has a suspect gym, but, 
and other guys we've seen the Norris knock people out, like put them out. So I could see the Norris hitting Crawler with some stuff early. Crawler thinking, you know what, I'm not gonna be able just to walk him down like I did with other guys or stuff like that. And possibly the Norris takes a decision, but that's what I hope anyway. I hope that happens. So you know, Joe Gallagher trading of the year loses all his world champions in 2000, the following year, 2016, and it'll be great. And then America kicks him out of the gym. Oh, mate, you won't be able to pay the rent anymore. No world <laughs> champion. <laughs> I've picked against Cruella quite a few times recently, and even though I was uh, upset at doing it and I was happy he won, I think to continue the trend, I might have to pick Lenares so... In, in that way, the, my theory is that Crawler will win. But I think it's definitely a tough fight for him. And like you said, Lenar is, um his combinations and he, he varies it up quite well. I don't know. I, I was watching a bit of the Mitchell fight though today. Like Mitchell was catching him clean with a lot of shots. Man. I think Mitchell has got more power than Crawler. But if, 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 if Crawler can do combinations... And just do like a sustained attack where you know he, he keeps just breaking him down. I could see you know Lanero just um, getting stopped off accumulation, but it it would have to be like accumulation, like you said. I can't see him stopping him with one shot upstairs. He'd have to just kind of have to beat his face into a pulp until you know. To be fair though, Mitchell is, but I think Mitchell's a lot more talented than Crawler. You know, I mean, so maybe. Maybe Lenares maybe like struggled with Mitchell because Mitchell's Mitchell's talent. I mean, Mitchell is quite good, man, defensively as well. He he's got good movement as well. So I don't know, but I just think Crawler Crawler's style would be made for someone like Lenares. That's what I think, anyway. Mm. Blatsky, Mastro, you got any thoughts? Lenares is hard. That's it, man. He's gonna catch him like he's gonna catch him and put him to sleep, bro. Lenar's got those like short punches that just come in really heavy, man. That's all I got. I got Lenar's bit. Hey, who's on that undercard? Is it even worth mentioning on the show or not? Nope. I'm not even all talking right, about the undercard. On. It was. It's awful. Uh, all right, let's also talk about Marco Hook over McKenzie. I don't know about this fight because when you look at box rec, it's got no undercard, and then when you go to over McKenzie's box rec page, there's a fight penciled in for the Fury Klitschko 2 undercard, which is like a month later. And I don't know why it's in there because you don't know what's going to happen in the fight against Hook. If you get stopped, then you might not be able to fight in October. So I could just see, you know, midweek, oh yeah, the Hook McKenzie fight's off for some shit because something always happens with like Box Nation fights. So many times, you know, a fight doesn't manifest. It just something happens, and there's there's no other date set, and both guys go in different directions. And I like Oval. Like I've said it many a times, but he's not really a cruiserweight man. He's he's more of a heavyweight. It's just that no one, sorry, a light heavyweight. It's like no one really wanted to fight him at light heavy, so he stepped up to cruiser. Because even against uh, Ramirez in Argentina, like Ramirez came in at the two hundred pound limit, and Oval was like one ninety one. So it's like. He's, he's he's a small dude compared to some of these cruisers, and even though Hook I think's on the on the way down on on, on the slide, I still think he's he, he he's a big dude. He punches hard. He's been in that division a long time, and I think and Oval if he doesn't take most of his opponents out by like the fifth sixth round, then it's it's over, man. Even though he's a hard hitter, I don't think he really hits that hard at cruiser. But what were you gonna say, Jack? Box Nation is fucking. God damn, man. Those motherfuckers are like in the Stone Age, man. Like, their cars break down. Fucking Fury couldn't go to the Klitschko press conference. They're barely upgrading their system so you fuckers could finally buy that shit on your TV with a remote. <laughs> like, god damn, man. Step up your fucking game, dude. You're fucking letting Eddie Hearn fucking leave you in the dust. Box Nation emails are probably still like AOL. <laughs> That's some funny shit, man. Fuck. That's sad. Nilton, you got any thoughts? Um, yeah, I'm, I'd imagine that it's probably going to wind up being an analysis canceled because I was just checking on it myself, and yeah, there's no card info at all. It's just 
Hug versus McKenzie, so that's kind of weird. Like that normally doesn't happen. Where it's just one fight, so especially it's like probably, the fact that it's Monday yeah. and this fight's on Saturday. Yeah, it's probably something that they just kind of left on the schedule and they never bothered to modify it. So uh, I, I doubt that it's it still happens, showing so. up on Box Nation schedule though. But that doesn't really mean shit. I don't know. I mean, I would favor Hug to win the fight, but yeah, it's, I mean, the it's it may or may not happen. So. Yeah, Hamada, you uh, when the prediction league was still going, once upon a time, you magically picked Matty Askins by majority decision, and it actually happened. And afterwards, you told us that he did it by mistake. But yeah, um, what's your thoughts on Hook versus um, Ovo McKenzie? Oh uh, yeah, Mark Hook actually looks like Matty Askins, doesn't it? He does a bit, yeah. Yeah, he does. Um, I don't know, man. You can never. You can never, you know, write off the upsetter, you know. I mean, he's, that's what he does. He knocks people out early. If you, if you can't knock you out early, then that's it. He loses. But uh, I don't know. Huck is shot, and he's got a good chance of actually, you know, winning. But it's a tall order, you know, going to Germany. If it goes to points, then it's it's, it's Huck's going to get the decision. Like he has a lot of his career. Huck's got a lot of, you know, benefit of the doubt with decisions over his career. So, Oval's got to go for that knockout. And if you don't get it, then he's just going to lose. Yep. And there's uh, one more kind of notable card at the StubHub on Saturday. Donny Nieta's fighting Edgar Sosa for the vacant WBO Intercontinental Flyweight. I hate Intercontinental titles. Bullshit. But uh, Naota, our boy, uh, Mark Magseo is on the undercard as well. Yeah, yeah. He's fighting um, a guy that's, you know, he's he's uh, a creditable, um, you know, French contender journeyman type guy, Romero Robles. Uh, should be an easier fight for him than the than the Avalos fight was. I think they probably t- took him as a slight step back from that level of opponent because of the fact that it was... More action packed than I think they would have hoped. They would have hoped that he would have, you know, just kind of cleaned up Avalos a lot easier than he did. But, you know, that's the way things go sometimes. But, um, yeah, no, Nietes is basically making his debut at Flyweight. Uh, you know, of course, he's chasing the bigger money fights in spite of the fact that Gonzalez and Estrada have now abandoned Flyweight. So, um, this is ostensibly for him to become like the, you know, number one type contender for the WBO, which Estrada just vacated and which, um, Zosha Ming's probably going to be fighting. For against um, Papo and the dude that kind of looks like Manny Pacquiao that he already beat, so um, that Zoe will probably win that fight again, get the title, and then potentially we may see him versus Nietes as long as Nietes gets the job done against Sosa, which I think he will, because Sosa to me was never really the same after that that loss that he suffered against Mayo when he got his fucking skull fractured by a head clash, and then um, you know lately he just hasn't looked all that great. You know, Roman Gonzalez mowed him down in a couple of rounds and. Um, I expect Nietes to um, do a pretty good number on him, probably stop him late. But, I mean, you never know sometimes with these vets, you know, he could we could be in for a Hasagaba type situation where he may upset the apple cart, upset the odds, but I don't really expect him to. I really wish I was at this, I was able to go to this shit, man. I was stuck at some fucking baby shower. Well, I, that, was, that was my next question. Obviously... Sep- late September in LA, like, is it still temperatures are still good for an outdoor event? Fuck no, it's getting cold, man. That's what I was thinking. It's a bit late. Yeah, I mean, it, when once it once it gets past a certain time, it gets it gets pretty chilly. Yeah. So take the hoodie weather. Yeah. Right. Nah, right. we gotta take the ski mask and rob these motherfuckers, man. <laughs> Well, let's see. Saturday, it looks like it's going to be a high ninety-two, low low of sixty-three. So I mean, it won't be that. It won't be that cool. Shit, like, ski mask, man. You might have to skip the baby show and go to the fights. <laughs> I know, right? Fuck it. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's nah, it's all still I... pretty warm in the daytime for the most part, but that's all I've got for this week, guys. You guys got anything else you want to talk about? Uh, it's, uh, it's, that's pretty much it. It's kind of unfortunate that it seems like most of the next month after this weekend is going to be, I mean, almost dead. You know, a lot of smaller cards of, like, contenders and journeymen. It's just really a shame, you know, that there was 
so little to be had right now because I mean, for the most part, at least for most of the year, uh, it seemed like you know there was a lot of cards to pick up the slack from PBC or for, you know from the UK or Japan or whoever. But I hear you. For most of October is pretty much dead as far as everybody. Like, there's no promoters putting on any shows, really, in terms of like world championship level fights until um, Fury versus Klitschko. So. It's and Ward Kovalev, things right? have, have happened like that. War Kovalev too is coming up, so. No, that's I'm not, not until afterwards, shit. though. Yo, man, I, I, I don't know, man, but I'm just gonna get my final thoughts and bounce, bit, man. Richard Schaefer, man, wherever you are, man, we need you back, baby. We need you back. We need you robbing all these motherfuckers, man. Steal their fighters and, and just, and just, and just give us some fucking good fights, man. As, as Canelo will say, brindalos con unas buenas peleas, man. <laughs> All right, thank yeah. you, Joe. Just off the schedule that you guys were talking about, even though they're not big fights, the UK is quite busy in October. We've got Ke- Cleverly Bremer in Germany. Um, obviously, this is not UK, but Park is fighting Dimitrenko in New Zealand. Then we got Ricky Burns fighting in Glasgow, and then we also have uh, Liam Walsh fighting, and there's uh, Tony Bellew versus Flores. So. Every week, I guess, in October, we have got, like, domestic cards over here. So it's still a busy month over here. Uh, October 21st, Josh Taylor's fine in Edinburgh against Dave Ryan. I think that'd be a good fight. We discussed it a few weeks ago. So, yeah, October's quite busy in the UK. Hopefully um, some good fights. And that's about it. Um, sad to say my final thoughts today. The bad news is here now. Um, our Scottish brethren has left the coalition. Um, he, he said to us uh, during this last week that he's not really got personal time to concentrate on watching boxing. Um, and he just wants to, you know, concentrate on his personal life, concentrate on his career, which is fair enough, man. You know, he's 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 a brother. He's a co-founder of the coalition. We're going to miss him. And, um, you know, the door's always open if he wants to come back. Even just a random show like we do chemo specials, you can always come back to that, man. But MV2, Lewis, man, good luck on your endeavours, man. And that's all I've got. Thanks. Yo, we got bagpipe music to, to exit them out or what? I should have done that, you know, but I had to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, the feeling's mutual, though, you know, uh, we have our clashes and everything, but, you know, it's always a, it's always fun to uh, be able to talk with MV2 about boxing and really about anything outside of sport as well. You know, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, that everything's, st- you know, th- that, that he manages to get his uh, his stuff in order that he wants to get in order and he, uh, he, he, he um, you know, has a, a stronger, better life, you know. Uh, with or without, you know, and uh, definitely whenever he comes back on, it'll be a it'll be a privilege to be able to talk with the man again. Yo, true, you know I love you, man. You know we love you like a brother over here, man. But you, you, man, you a you a freaking creep. You know that you a freaking creep. <laughs> you know, true, uh, we love you, man. Don't don't fucking leave us, man. You gonna you gonna leave us hanging like Schaefer, man. Don't don't do this to us, man. <laughs> we need you, man. Thank you, Ski Mask. Thanks to all the guys that jumped on the show today, all the people in the chat, and all the people that download the show week in, week out. We'll be back next week. We love you, Chew. Peace. Peace. You just listened to the Boxing Coalition. I did. Man, I love boxing. I fucking love boxing. A big shout out to the Boxing Coalition. You're a newbie. No, I ain't new, man. If my fucking next door neighbor became the number one flyweight in the world, you know what I'd do? I'd fucking walk past the country. Derek, how you doing, bro? I was physically bad, you blood. I disagree. First time I hear the song, man, it was fucking badass. Vamos a Argentina, la concha de su madre. I see the bomb in them. I get home and she's like, what the fuck? Me and the kid are here. Why don't you get home and talk to us? I'm like, man, you guys don't know shit about bikes. Kel, how does it feel to be the new IBF champion? It feels great. Right. Do we really dive into the black hole right off the jump? I think he's hiding glass. Just to play devil's advocate. You want one portion of crow or two portions of crow? Give me uh, two portions with a supersized fries and, um, and a large drink, please. I can't stand him while I'm Scottish. Cringe sight. But you won't crush Anthony fucking fat ass Joshua, would you? He's not fat. Yeah, How about you tell us what you weighed for your final thoughts? <laughs> My weight? Thank you for listening to the Boxing Coalition. We are live every Monday, 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. UK time. 
5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern.